Oh, thank you very much, Elizabeth Adachesh, for leading the experts in that first Ask the Expert session uh, that really is bringing this target gender equality 2022 to life. It's been a great pleasure moderating over the last five hours. We're coming up to 12 a.m. midnight here in Hong Kong. I think you were just warming up 12 noon over in New York. We've had a business call to action. We've had a keynote from Ukraine. We've had polls. We've had lounges. Uh, we've had the RC expert, the learning paths, and much, much more. And it's so exciting to be able to sit a little bit to one side and see all that dynamism coming through, including on the regional groupings and the other special sessions with UN Women as well. Well, you know, just on a final note over here, I did a little bit of work with he for she when I was over in Beijing, and I saw a couple of questions in the chat and also to the expert, Edward, asking, you know, do men lose out in a way? I'd say that uh, as, as one of those men, my life has been enhanced, my opportunities have been enhanced when that more inclusive, high quality space has been created. And personally speaking, I think almost throughout my entire career, I've only ever worked for women. And so if I've got anyone to thank for, for getting to the place where I'm able to moderate today, it will have to be for all the mentors and the compassionate and skilled guidance I've had at every step of the way. I want to thank you and Global Compact for having me here as one of your moderators today, because I'm going to hand over to your other moderator today, uh, my co-host, Victoria Rubadiri, who's standing over live in Nairobi, Kenya. Victoria, you've been listening for the last couple of hours, I know, and I, I can't wait to see what you're going to be navigating us through over the next couple of hours from where you sit over in Africa. Thanks so much, Victoria, and it's so nice to be able to see you across the screen. As we always say in these pandemic days, I hope we have the opportunity and I have the honor face to face one day. Certainly, James, looking forward to that. And right here in Nairobi, Kenya, it is heading to seven o'clock actually on the dot. Uh, so we're heading into the evening hours in East Africa. Thank you for that warm introduction all the way from Hong Kong, James. And welcome to the second half of a Target Gender Equality Live 2022. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be your host MC for the next part of today's event. Now, this morning, we've listened to inspiring calls to action and heard from leading global experts, practitioners, and researchers on gender equality business and sustainable development but there is so much more believe me and don't forget to join the conversation on social media to share your experience ideas calls to action as we go along using the hashtag target gen equality and of course tag us you know what they say if you don't tweet it it happen but tag us on twitter at global compact and i've been watching along this morning and seen a lot of activity in the chat which is Great to see so many people joining together to stand up for gender equality. Let me just hop over to the chat section really quickly. Um, I see um, Nashoba saying, great moderating skills, James. Absolutely. Uh, he is a tough act to follow, so I'll do my best to keep the momentum going. Um, Marcy Rosenstock saying, uh, sessions uh, are great and looking forward to many more. Keep the conversations going. Pamela Campana saying, fabulous and engaging. We intend to keep that uh, throughout the sessions coming up. Fantastic. So uh, next up is a chat between two inspiring female leaders. Uh, leading the discussion is Musimbi Kanyoro. She is not only a board member at the UN Global Compact, but also advises the team on the Target Gender Equality Initiative. Now, Musimbi started her activism as a teenager in Kenya but since then has amplified her work at a global scale on multiple platforms, as we'll see a bit later on. Musimbi will be chatting to Sophia Scarlett, who is a student and a founder of Romania's first ever gender equity organization for teenagers and has spoken out against gender-based violence around the world. Well, we're gonna listen in and learn about their personal journeys, but also which tools you can leverage to turn your passion into activism. And to give you a little taste of how urgently activism efforts are still needed, let's do another poll, right? So the question is, how many economies have laws constraining women's decisions 
to join and remain in the labor force, all right? And your options there, A, around 9%, around 22%, around 40%, or around 75%. I can see some of your results coming in already, but keep them coming. I will get to the results a bit later on, so it's as easy as choosing the answer that you want by clicking on the choice right here on the main stage screen. But at this juncture, please welcome our speakers as we delve into this conversation. Thank you so, so much for, for taking the time to speak with me and I guess for us to have this dialogue. I guess one thing that I'm really, really curious to know from you is wearing, wearing your activist hat, I guess, throughout all of these years, what, what would you say is one, one message that you would send to companies or organizations who are seeking to pursue and to advance gender equality um, advice or, or suggestions or things like that? Thank you, Sophia. It's really a privilege to have a conversation with you. I often uh, really enjoy conversations with us. Uh, you have referred to younger people because what they do is that they remind me that I began my own activism uh, when I was very young, when I was actually a teen. And so when I see younger people and even teenagers and even pre-teenagers, I get very excited because it, for me it's an evidence that uh, the ball is rolling and we will continue to be um, uh, activists for change. So I want to begin to reflect on your questions by uh, um, uh, defining for me what activism means. For me, activism means that being convinced that you can be part of bringing about social change or political change on any issue whatsoever that is uh, 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 important to you. And usually you need a platform to do that. And once you have that platform, that platform then enables you to operate within the parameters that are open to you. So if I had a company in a place of a company, or if I was uh, in the position where I am now as a senior advisor to the UN Global Compact, my advice to a company which is interested to have gender equality is to actually ask the question, are you serious about this? Do you really want to do gender equality? And if the answer is yes, which is true, for many, many companies who engage and want to bring gender equality to the organization, you need to be able to have policies that support that goodwill, that thinking. And policies are not dependent on just the gender equality. It really means that having policies in the organization that are sufficiently supporting intersectionality and diversity and inclusion in many different ways. These things help you to ground what you want to do in the question of gender equality. When they don't exist, you don't have enough grounding and credibility for what you're doing because people will look at what the company is doing and say, the company is interested in women. What about us, people with disabilities or a particular race? It's not enough to say we are gender equal and then you hire people of one race belonging or covering the gender aspects that you want to, but it's also a choice that requires work. It requires investments of time. It requires engagement. It requires resources, financial and people resources. I know that you are aware of many of these issues. So I'm going actually to ask you a reverse question to reflect with me since you've been doing activism for, uh, um, I should say long enough, since you started very early at the age of 15, how would you describe for yourself some of the memorable achievements you've done by um, being an activist? I've worked with, with communities, I've worked with government agencies, I've worked with local embassies, um, I've worked with other NGOs and, and with other activists. And I think in doing all of those things, I, I look back and I realize that the true change and the true learning process for me happened when I was doing something that people didn't necessarily understand or didn't necessarily agree with. And I think that that's a lot of what activism is all about. And it's, I think it kind of touches on what you were saying earlier um, about implementing um, new policies within a company or within a structure. 
it's that oftentimes, you know, people are afraid of, of change. People are afraid of new things, things that they haven't tried before. They don't fully understand. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing that I've kind of taken away from this whole experience is that you can't commit to progress if you're not committing to being vulnerable and to being um, put in situations that you've never been in before. Um, you have to be ready to think things that you've never thought before and then be ready to act on those things because then you are really revolutionizing the community that you're in, the policies that you're working with. Oftentimes, when I when I was starting out, I think as a uh, an especially young activist when I was 15, I was trying to work within the system, right? Try to revolutionize, but using the tools and the rules that we have um, at our disposal now, you know? stuff that was already around me. And I think that that is a good start um, because there are good resources that we can tap into and there are wonderful people who you need to be connected with and who you need to work with. Um, but at the same time, I think that I've learned that a lot of progress and change happens when you go outside of the structure that already exists. Mm -hmm. um, you can't fully change a society or a community or a company um, if you're just working with the stuff that you already have, because the stuff that you already have is where the problem lies, right? So you have to rethink the way that, that your environment works. I think that when I was starting out, I was very eager to be involved and to be heard. I felt like I had never been given a platform before, so I was ready to just kind of take any platform that was being offered to me. Um, but I think that I've learned that there's a very fine line between being represented and being heard and actually just being um, kind of tapped into for your resources and your energy and potential and not receiving the support that you need to keep working um, from the companies or organizations that are working with you. Um, so I, I, I think now a lot about my position as a young advocate. And when I work with other young advocates, I, I try to make sure that they're also protected in, in their energy and in their efforts. Um, we are incredibly intelligent and um, energetic and empowered individuals, and we deserve to be heard. But at the same time, we deserve to be recognized for our efforts in a way that helps us keep our our mental health safe and, and our energies preserved. Um, young advocates work incredibly hard, and they deserve to be repaid for that work just as, as much as any other advocate. This is kind of what I've found. But I, I'm really interested to kind of hear your thoughts on that as well, because you, you also started very young. Yes, yeah. Uh, when I look back, Sophia, at this particular time, it's very interesting that um, when I was young and doing my activism at a, a very local uh, level, at that time, we were interested in um, uh, making sure that the apartheid system in South Africa, far away from us, would be abolished, far, because I'm Kenyan. So for me, I began on a big issue at a local level, but organizing was really important, and organizing a community that you know seemed to be the natural thing to do with other young people, whether they were from scouts or girl guides or those kind of communities where organization really exists. So I do believe that organizing and, and the change um, has to be located somewhere. But nowadays, as one who has uh, been having more of the global um, platform, I find that um, it's very easy to say many words at the global level because in activism, as we are aware, we use many different methods. They are the methods of campaigning, of organizing, of writing letters, of uh, um, speaking up on various issues. It's really easy to speak up at international level on many things that you want to say in the way that you want to say them. The big question is that who takes it seriously? Uh, because you really want to see action happening. And I think that to be able to see action hap ha uh, happening you have either to be engaged with a particular group of people where you are seeing and supporting their actions so that you can see a policy that is changed. And policies are changed mostly at national level, at local level. So that um, I'm very much in favor of, lo all of, of all of the protocols that we achieve at the United Nations, but I'm even better in favor when I can see them become part of laws of countries or practices of countries or where the countries can actually domesticate those issues and make them become uh, something that is tangible in that context. Now, I think that you probably might uh, um, have had similar experience with me that activism is not always a favored word 
So when people hear about activists, they get afraid because they get afraid of uh, militants. They get afraid that they, they are being um, uh, forced to see or to do what they don't want to do in the way that activists wants to do it with the urgency that is usually on our in our hearts, on our lips, in our actions. Because we see these things as not just happening today, but we see thing, these things as systemic. And so we want the systemic change to happen now so that lives can be saved, so that happiness can be brought to people, so that people's mental health can be restored. But very often, governments are not ready, companies are not ready, institutions are not ready. And very often, that's why activists really organize to keep the, to keep the ball running and to keep the fire burning uh, so that people don't uh, begin things and leave them unfinished without backing up resources to do it. Also, that they don't speak the words, but not follow them with actions. So that has been my experience, continuous. Activism is something that is continuous. Um, you, you are not defined in activism by the kind of academic education that you've had, but you are defined by the convictions that you have. I think generally people are a little bit afraid of, of the term activist, and especially I think of my own country's history that has um, involved negative connotations of the word activist. And so I understand when people are afraid or uh, unsure of my intentions when I'm coming into a community and trying to work with them to, to create certain change or progress. Um, but I, I try to keep that history in mind and context is very important. Being culturally aware is very important. Um, and that's something that any company or organization or activist should keep in mind is to learn the context that they're working in. Um, but I, I think that I try to by presenting myself as a young advocate and by presenting myself as just a member of the community who has noticed some issues and just wants to make things better, um, I try to kind of make that activist image seem as though it could be anyone, because it really could be anyone. Um, you don't have to have a certain level of, of experience or preparation. You don't have to have certain degrees to be an, act, an activist. You don't have to have worked in the government or to have worked in an NGO you honestly don't even need to have read extensive literature and like research papers on the topics that you're working with. Obviously you should always be learning and you should always try to have this information and to understand more perspectives and to talk to more people, but anyone can be an activist in the sense that anyone should be an activist um, because you are part of a community and you have to show solidarity with the people in that community. And if you notice an issue, I, I try to remind people that, you know, it is your responsibility to step up and, and to try and do your part. And that doesn't mean that you have to lead protests or to, you know, lobby in parliament or in your government every single day. It doesn't mean that you have to be sending letters um, or, you know, doing any of these activities that we associate with activism. You don't have to be constantly working towards this goal, but activist could also mean that you are raising donations within your community um, or that when you, you know, you know that one of the families in your community is in need of food or they need to repair the roof on their house and they might not have the funds and you step up and you, you try to help in that situation, you try to mobilize other people in the community to assist. That's activist work as well. Understanding that these issues are part of of the system that we live in and part of the structures that we interact with in our day-to-day -day lives. And then understanding that those structures can change because they've not always been this way and they won't always be this way. Um, society has progressed because we've constantly reflected on what is happening around us and on how it's affecting us. Um, and it's going to continue changing in those ways. And that's inherently activist thought and activist work in my mind. Um, and that's how I try to kind of look at it and how I try to bring it into my communities um, and the ones that I interact with, especially at home, because I think people are very disempowered at the moment and they need to gain back that, that power and that autonomy to make decisions because they can. Um, I think maybe now in, in our society and at least in, in the communities that I work with, I tend to see that people think that there's someone else who is better suited to make decisions for them. You know, we have politicians, we have the, the mayor, we have the church, we have all of these structures and we think that they are the ones who know better. They're the ones who 
should decide. They're the ones who should know what to do in a certain situation. Um, but the truth is that although they can help and although they also should be thinking about those issues, regular people and community members also have the same power and the same intelligence and the same energy to think about the issues around them and to make decisions. And I think people need to be reminded that they have that ability as well and that they should be using it to the fullest extent um, because that is also activism in itself. And, and I think that that's really what's most important. Yeah, so if you're listening to you, I think that my, um, I say concluding remarks to the audience who might be listening to us is that uh, each one of us is at some point an activist at some point, one that has to implement what activism is asking. So for those of you who are leaders, I think it's really nice. I have been a leader for many years of organizations, and, and I find that it's very helpful when you have among the staff that are employed, people who really care for issues, and at some point, take up the activist uh, hat, the way the uh, activist hat, because they help to see the details sometimes a leader is not aware of. And it's usually the people that are affected that become activists for these issues. And when people speak from the experience of, uh, I am feeling this way, I am experiencing this way, they are the best change makers because they put light on a reality that exists within a country or within an organization or within a company that requires being addressed. So people should not be afraid of activism within the organization. On the other, if I flip the coin, I should say, I for one has always believed that activism should not be followed by distraction because distractions actually take the resources away from either getting improvements. And lastly, I want to say that activism is very much right now completely changed by the presence of social media. It's not the same as used to be seen before by the presence of different types of, of medias that exist today. In some ways, it has opened up the possibilities that people can have more access to activism in other ways that they are, it's very difficult sometimes to know where the truth lies. So it's a little bit of a, a mixture of everything at where we are, but we must be able to see that the whole essence of activism is to bring about social change that benefits many people through policy changes and practices. And um, I believe that you have a closing word too, Sophia. Yeah, um, I think everything that you said, you said beautifully, and I really echo all of those sentiments. And I think, you know, especially now, um, I'm reflecting a lot on, on my region back at home of, of Eastern Europe, and I'm, I'm thinking of Ukraine and what's happening there. And I'm thinking of um, all of the people who are going to be affected and who are being affected by this conflict right now. Um, all of the refugees are already entering the Republic of Moldova, Romania, and neighboring countries. Um, and I, I, I really echo the sentiment that you you shared earlier that societies and that our, our communities and that and the companies and organizations and whatever structure you're talking about is built through education and solidarity, not through violence and not through war. Um, and I think that. That is something that I, I really feel like is an important closing remark, and it's something that people can take away in, in every environment, no matter how big or small. Yes, it could refer to a country level, but it could also just mean that within your company, you want to talk to people, and you want to be open, and you want to make sure that people are learning and growing, and that you have constant dialogue and debate and conversation, and that different perspectives are heard and that all perspectives are respected and that there is a, a constant sentiment of solidarity and that people are um, are counted and that they matter within within the company culture and within an organization and and so on um, I think that's one of the bigger takeaways of my activist career and I'm kind of very very happy to see that we share that perspective and, and that you share that perspective so I guess late in your career um, and that it's something that it stuck with you. I think it will stick with me and I, I hope that it's something that more people can learn. Um, and I kind of just wanna leave that as my only takeaway from this conversation. Um, although this has been just such a fantastic opportunity and I'm so thankful 
um, to have been able to sit down with you. I hope other people have found it um, as, as wonderful as I have.